reading from Luke, the 13th chapter. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Father, we thank you for this reading of your infallible and errant word. We thank you for the treasure that we have in the word of God given to us at great cost, not only by yourself, but by others through history who have not only accepted your revelation and written it down and communicated it, but by those who have translated it at great expense and sometimes at the cost of their own life so that we could have it in our hands this very morning. Thank you. Father, we bring before you some who are ailing in our congregation, Lord. I especially think of Shirley this morning, this 87-year-old woman who has broken her wrist and her hip yesterday, who's been with us for the last few months, has really come to faith in Christ over that period of time, and loves our congregation, has no other family, and looks at us as her adopted family. And um, Lord, I just pray that you will sustain her through uh, the surgeries and whatever else she has to go through, bring her safely through all that. We uh, pray for your comfort in her life and for your grace in her life. Thank you for the friends who have, uh, Lord, so ably and so lovingly uh, uh, cared for her even over the last few weeks and months. Bless her. And Lord, there are many others who can't, don't have time to go through all the names and all the issues, but Within our church, as within any, we have every issue there is, from financial to emotional to spiritual to family to relationship, and Lord, we commit them to you. We pray for your help in the lives of all of us. But Father, we know it has to start with a absolute submission to the authority of your word and to obedience to your commands. So much of what we have, we bring on ourselves. And then there are other reasons, as we will see this morning. And so we pray for your grace. We need it. We trust it to you. We thank you for the news this week that Daniel, Losey, they have found new insurance that will allow for this heart transplant that this little 11-year-old boy needs. Pray that you will see him safely through that, that you will provide, Lord, the right donor. That, that in itself uh, kind of takes our breath away. We pray that your hand will be in all of the arrangements with all those who will be touched. Bring him safely through, we pray. Thank you for the testimony of this family. Bless the time that follows today, Father, at the picnic, and we pray that we will be bound together in love even stronger. We pray that we will, um, Father, find that uh, we have commonality in certain things and where we don't we can love and accept one another and enjoy the fellowship together may that be true but right now father we pray that all of our fellowship and all of our attention and all of our thoughts will be focused on your word as we spend these moments seeking your will seeking to understand who you are and what you desire we pray this in the name of our precious lord and savior jesus christ amen you may be seated and uh, please turn with me to Luke 13. Uh, I'm, 14 years ago, the morning of 14 years ago last Friday, I was getting ready for work when we got a phone call at home. I assumed it would be one of the people around the world that I worked with at that time, but it was my mother who was only 60 miles away but who 
sounded very relieved to find out that I was at home because in those days I was traveling about 75% of the time. So I said, well, why are you so relieved? What's, what's going on? Why are you calling? She said, well, you better turn on your TV, which we did in time to see the North tower of the World Trade Center in flames, as I'm sure many of you did, and in time to watch the speculation that was going on about why some plane had apparently accidentally flown into that building, only to see another plane a few minutes later fly into the South Tower, and eventually watch as those towers crumbled to the ground, resulting in the deaths of 2,996 people, more than were killed at Pearl Harbor was a sobering time. It was a sobering time in our nation as for a brief period of time, people began to go back to church, began apparently to think about spiritual things, which apparently has not lasted for a long time. But it always raises the question when these kind of tragedies come up, right? Why? Why did this happen? Where was God? That's always the question. And it's tempting as many did, to give the simple, easy answer that these events were God's judgment on sin. And many responded that way only to have to recant at the great outcry that occurred at that particular simple answer. A question in my mind this morning is, what would Jesus say? And the text before us says that Jesus would say something like this. He would say, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. Instead of asking, why did this happen to them? The question you should be asking is, why did this not happen to me? That is the question. Jesus is introducing here the fact that we are all born under a death sentence. That this is the human condition, that we are morally bankrupt, all of us. The wonder is not that some face judgment in this particular fashion. The wonder is that any of us are left standing at all. Because if we got what we deserved, immediately we would not be. God tells the Israelites, Deuteronomy, that he is such a holy God that if he came among them, he would consume them. And the New Testament makes the same point in Hebrews 12, verse 29, when it says simply, in very simple terms, our God is a consuming fire. We do not understand the righteousness of God, and we do not understand the sinfulness of man. We are all living on borrowed time, beloved. We are all living on borrowed time. And so I want for us over the next couple of weeks to look at these first five verses and then we will continue under the same sermon series, if you will, Living on Borrowed Time. In these first five verses, we want to look at two great tragedies, two grave traps, and that's what we'll look at this morning in particular. And then next week, two gospel truths that come out of this passage. So let's start with two great tragedies, heaven's perspective on Tragedy. Pontius Pilate is introduced in this passage for the first time in the book of Luke. Pontius Pilate was the governor of the southern part of Palestine in the days of Christ, which was called Judea, and he was also governor of Samaria. So he had these two uh, territories that were absolutely at odds with each other under his control. Herod the Great, when he died, left his kingdom. When he died shortly after the birth of Christ, he left his kingdom to uh, to some of his sons, one of whom had rulership over the southern part of Palestine, but even the Romans couldn't stand him. And so they put a governor in in that place. Meantime, up north in Galilee, where Jesus lived, where the Sea of Galilee was, the ruler was Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod. So that's kind of the geographical setting here. And it's a very important one because the Jews in Galilee and the Jews in Judea, 
while they all hated the Samaritans in the middle, they didn't like each other very much either. And the Jews in Judea particularly looked down on the Jews in Galilee as being kind of poor country cousins. And so as, as we look at this first tragedy, we see that here is a reference to Pilate. He was the governor who had been in power since 26 AD. He was appointed by the emperor Tiberius to this rather difficult job in southern Palestine. And was for a while, there was some question in the early days about whether Pilate was even in Israel, and people used to question the validity of the New Testament because of that, but one of the things we saw when we were in Palestine was a, uh, an inscription on a wall that had been uncovered as late as 1960, and the, and the inscription clearly referenced Pontius Pilate as being the one who was governor in Judea at this particular point in time. So we know that that's true. Pilate was not a good man. He was insensitive and cruel, and that's about as kind a thing as you can say about him. He hated the Jewish people, and they hated him in, in, in turn. Now, the Jews in Galilee were the ones who were the most opt to rebel against Rome. So were the ones in Judea, but Galilee, that's where the unrest was centered most of the time. And what we know is that just prior to the happening that we read about in verse 1 of this chapter is that there was an uprising among the Galileans. And the uprising seems to have been related to something Pilate did. We know that at one point in time he appropriated temple money in order to build an, a much-needed aqueduct, but he thought, well, nah, Jews need the aqueduct, the Jews ought to build it, and so he took money from the temple to do it. And the Galileans, in particular, were incensed about that. So when they came down for a feast in Jerusalem, and they brought their feast, Herod, uh, not Herod, but uh, Pilate, sent his troops out, dressed as commoners, to be among this crowd of people who were kind of rabble-rousers, and they had hidden under their, under their togas their weapons, and at a given signal, they all pulled them out in order to disperse this mob of people, which resulted in the death of many, and their blood mixed with the death, with the blood of the sacrifices that they were bringing. That's the historical reference that these Jewish people bring up here. Now, remember that just prior to this, if you weren't with us the last couple of weeks, Jesus had been addressing a a crowd of mostly Judean Jews because he's moving his way down toward Jerusalem for his final encounters there. And he berates those Jewish people for being so good at knowing the signs of the weather and being able to read those signs, but not reading the signs of the times, not recognizing in him the promised Messiah and not believing in him. He urged them to settle accounts with God out of court by which he meant, repent of your sins while you have time in this life. Don't go into the judgment of God unrepentant. Settle out of court. That's the last things he said at the end of chapter 12. But rather than heed his advice, these people go on the offensive. And so you get to chapter 13, verse 1, and it says there were some present at that very time, meaning in the crowd that he had warned, settle out of court. There were some in that crowd who said, who were present at that time, who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So the context here indicates so what these people are saying is, hey, Jesus, you think we don't understand signs? You are so wrong. We know the judgment of God when we see it, and only a couple of days ago, we saw it. We saw the judgment of God fall on your Galilean neighbors when Pilate slaughtered them. That is their human interpretation of the tragic event that involved a bunch of people from Galilee that they considered their moral inferiors. And that is their response to Jesus' warning about judgment. Judgment? God's judgment? That's for others, not for us. The second tragedy is mentioned by Jesus himself in verse 4. 
He says, or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Archaeologists have now uncovered the Pool of Siloam. It's mentioned in the New Testament. When we were there in 2010, some of you who are with us will remember that we went down to where the dig was still going on at the time, uncovering the Pool of Siloam, and we got to see what was there of it that had already been uncovered, some of the steps leading down into the pool and so on. Apparently, near that pool, there was a tower being built, perhaps even to accommodate this aqueduct that Pilate wanted to bring into town, to bring water to town. And somehow, poor construction or something else, the tower had fallen and it killed 18 innocent people. And so Jesus says, well, you want to talk about tragedies? Let's talk about this one too. I think Jesus has at least a couple of reasons for introducing that second tragedy. The first would be that it kind of fleshes out the types of tragedy, right? The first one was imposed by an evil man, Pilate. The second one was purely coincidental. It was just one of those accidents that happens, as best we can tell from the text. So you have tragedies of various and sundry kinds, right? And Jesus is saying, here's, here's another example, but this one is just something that happens. Coincidental. In our day, we'd probably call it an act of God. That's what you would write into contracts and so on. But I think there's a second reason, and that is because the first tragedy involved the despised Galileans. Jesus is kind of evening things up here a little bit and saying, well, yeah, by the way, Judeans get killed too in tragedies. You may have noticed the this Tower of Siloam that fell on 18 of your fellow countrymen, the Judeans, a few days ago as well. Jesus' audience wouldn't have been quite so quick to interpret that event as God's judgment, although given their background, that's where they almost certainly had to go. So that kind of sets the stage for us. That's the two tragedies, the two tragedies that are going on here. But Jesus' audience represents two very mistaken ways of looking at those tragedies. Two grave traps two wrong ways to look at the tragedies that have happened. And I want us to see those because this will help us appreciate next when we look at the gospel truths that Jesus gives here. But first to understand, what's the wrong way to look at this? What's the wrong way to look at ISIS? What's the wrong way to look at 9-11? What's the wrong way to look at the tragedies that occur in life? Two things. Number one, a grave trap is moralism moralism, which means the trap of thinking that people always, underline the word always, people always get what they deserve. That's moralism. Do people sometimes get what they deserve? Yes. No question about that, and we'll see that. But do people always get what they deserve in this life? No. That's moralism, and Jesus is going to speak against that. But to the audience, moralism was the thing. To them, the Galileans being killed were like an obvious sign of God's judgment. They were people who must have done some pretty awful sin to come under this kind of judgment. This is moralism. Moralism is the belief that life is a series of rewards or setbacks based on how you are living. Moralism sees a direct link between how somebody lives and falling towers. That's moralism. And Jesus knows this is the assumption of these people. Look at verse two. He says, do you think? Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And the answer would have been, yes, they did. And then in verse four, or do you think that these 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Yes, they did think that. But Jesus is going to react against that moralism as a way of looking at life. That thing that sees a direct connect between what happens to people and the way they live and the disasters they face. The religious moralist view goes like this. If you live a good life, you'll have a good life. 
If on the other hand, your finances, you have difficulty in your life, it's because you're doing something wrong. You must not be living right. You're being punished by God for something you've done. There's something wrong with you. You're not loving God and loving people, and therefore the tower is falling. And beloved, that's the, that's the default setting of our hearts. That's where we naturally go. We just naturally assume good things are going to happen to me if I do good, and bad things are going to happen to me if I don't. We are moralists by nature. We all tend that way. Only most of the time, see, we see ourselves as the good guys. Not very adept at seeing ourselves as the bad guys under that moralist scheme. Moralism. Some of you remember the, the actor Christopher Plummer. He starred in The Sound of Music, a, a, mu, a, mu, a movie that he hated, by the way. He called it The Sound of Mucus. That was his word for it. Uh, in the movie, you remember his character, Captain Von Trapp, falls in love with the nanny, Maria, played by uh, Julie Andrews. And when it becomes apparent toward the end of the movie that they're going to live happily ever after, they are absolutely entranced with each other. They're looking, staring into each other's arms, and then they begin to sing. It, it is a musical, right? Yeah, it's a musical. So they begin to sing. And what they sing to each other goes something like this, back and forth. For here you are, standing there, loving me, whether or not you should. Somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. That is a pure expression of moralism. And it gets a little worse as they go along. <laughs> nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever can. But somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. How else could I have you standing out there? That's moralism. What they're saying is if my life is turning out well, I must have done something right. If my children are growing up well, it's because I'm a smart parent. If my if, if my job is going well, it must be because I'm, I'm hardworking, I'm intelligent, I'm smart, I know the right people. If, I'm, you know, if people like me, I must be attractive, I must be doing something right. That's moralism, it's our default setting. Our heart wants to take the credit. Our heart wants to take the credit. You notice when they said nothing comes from nothing, what they really mean is this, what, whatever this is, it couldn't be grace, it couldn't be coming from nowhere, it must have been something I did Therefore, I get the credit. That's moralism, me taking the credit. Of course, when life falls apart, <laughs> the other side of that coin is I must have done something bad, right? Rodgers and Hammerstein don't write songs about that. They don't do musicals about that. Now, if you're in the country music, you may find it there, right? They like dogs dying and towers falling. I, you have to admit there is an element of our society that gets off on that, and so there are a few around. But we are naturally moralists, assuming that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Therefore, if my life is falling apart and towers are falling, I must have done something wrong. And if that's happening to someone else, I wonder what awful thing they did, right? What in the world is bringing this on them? R.C. Sproul one of his books, he tells about a woman whose high school son was arrested on drug charges. And of course, this was a devastating thing to the family at the time. But they began to work through it. And the mother, in particular, began to see how the Lord was using even this thing to work in her family to bring about some recognition of God's part in people's lives or the part God would like to pe play in people's lives. And she was taking it pretty well and she decided to share it with a friend. But when she shared it with her friend, the woman lashed out at her and said, you sh you're peaceful about this? You shouldn't be so peaceful. Don't you realize this was your fault? That's the kind of friends you need, right? That's a moralist. Moralism. And that's where Jesus' audience is coming from. They assumed that they were good and thus there were no towers falling on them. But the Galileans must have been awful. Moralism. To moralism, Jesus gives a quick response. He gives the same response in verse 3 and in verse 5. In verse 3, he says, no, I tell you. And in verse 5, he says, no, I tell you. That means he is not accepting of the moralistic point of view of life, the moralistic perspective on life. So, 
We're going to see what he says next, next week. So come back so we can explain that. But in the meantime, I just want you to see that he rejects moralism out of hand. And it gives us an opportunity to stand back and say, okay, well, what does the Bible, what's the Bible perspective on these tragic things that happen? When tragedy strikes, when things come out of the blue that are bad, how does the Bible look at that? And the first question would be obvious is, is it, is sometimes, is it a direct, is there a direct result connection between sin in the life of somebody and the tragedy? And the answer is yes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes there is a direct connect there. There was a direct connect, for example, at the time of the flood. Why did the flood happen? Genesis 6, 5 tells us, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Same thing was true of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? There's a direct connect there between the sin of the people and the judgment of God coming upon them. Now, remember in both of those cases, Jesus or God saw fit to take the righteous person, the people who were righteous at heart, not necessarily super righteous people, but those who were righteous at heart, he took them out of that of those situations. But sometimes towers fall in direct response to sin. Absolutely. But that's not the only reason, beloved. Suffering does not always indicate an immediate judgment on a, an immediate sin. The Bible is filled with other reasons that towers fall. It's filled with other reasons that tragedy strikes. Let me just give you a few examples. Sometimes tragedy strikes as a call to unbelievers to repentance. This is what happened to Saul in Acts chapter 8 on the road to Damascus as he was struck with this great light that shone from heaven and blinded him. It was a call to repentance, and fortunately he repented, and he became a follower of Jesus Christ. But the tragedy that struck was a call to repentance. Sometimes suffering is a test of faith. Oftentimes, it's a test of faith. It has helped me immensely to see that life is one big test, really, in many ways. The life of a believer is kind of an ongoing test. Sometimes a pop quiz on any given day. Sometimes it's like a midterm final. But a lot of things come into our life that are testing our faith. For example, God tells the Israelites in Deuteronomy 8, Two, when he announces to them, you guys are going to wander around in this wilderness for the next 40 years. Why? It says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. God's going to separate. He's going to find out who, who are true believers and who are not. It's a test. And who among the believers are, are going to follow him and who are going to drop by the wayside. Job 23, verse 10 says that, of God, when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That's what Job said in the midst of more trouble than I suppose any human being has ever faced. It's a test. I'll come out like gold at the end, but wow, the process, painful. It says in 1 Timothy, 1 Peter, I'm sorry, verse 1, verses six and, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Peter says, you have been grieved by various trials so that the testing, tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Life is one big test. It's aimed at all aimed at the glory of God. If we could understand it's also aimed at our good, it would be good for us. God's glory is always for our good. It's a test. Sometimes God allows difficult things to teach us humility and dependence. We are by nature independent people. And our culture and our society in America teaches us from the time we are young, right, to be independent. You can do whatever you choose to do. And we grow up with a very individualistic, very independent spirit. But Paul acknowledges in 2 Corinthians 12, that, he, that God gave him a tragedy in his life. Some, he calls it a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Bad eyes, malaria that constantly plagued him. 
perhaps evil teachers in Corinth that were just causing wrecking havoc there with his reputation, with the church in general. You can make a case for any of those, but something was there constantly. And Paul says, I prayed to the Lord three times and asked him to remove it. And the Lord said, no, you're going to keep that thorn in the flesh. That, by the way, Satan's the one who brought it. I allowed that. And then he tells him, tells him this, Paul, or Paul says this, he says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Paul had had revelations like no one had ever had. Paul had either been to heaven in person or in vision. He didn't even know which. He'd had the revelations that we know as the New Testament today that came from God. He had been trained, I think, specifically by Jesus. Galatians indicates that. He had something very few people had. He could have been a very proud man and apparently would have been, except God let this be in his life to teach him to depend on the Lord. And he, and he concludes by saying, okay, I, mean, I, I got it. My weakness is going to be your strength. That's what I want to have happen. Dependence. God allows bad things to build character. Romans 5, verses 3 and 4. James chapter 1. Romans 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and, pro and character produces hope. God wants to, to build us, and He uses sometimes tragic events in order to allow that to happen. God uses suffering in order to keep us from getting too entangled in this world. Very prone to that, right? We're very prone to love the things of the, Lord, of the world more than we love God. Does God want us to love the things of the world and use them? Absolutely. He says, I've given you every good thing to enjoy, 1 Timothy 4 and 1 Timothy 6. But you can't love those more than me. That was the problem with the rich young ruler. That's what Jesus was pointing out to him. You're trying to have your money with one hand and me with the other, and it won't work. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18, he says this for this, Paul says this, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look to the things that are seen uh, look, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. How will we ever learn that? Suffering will teach us that. God allows bad things to discipline us to obedience. Hebrews 12, 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. That's, there's a difference between punishment and discipline, between judgment and discipline. Discipline has the end in mind of bringing change into our lives, right? And he's saying sometimes this tragedy that has happened is to discipline you, to teach you obedience. It's not God's judgment falling on you. It's discipline. Sometimes God allows bad things, and we don't particularly like this, but he allows it to prepare us to comfort others. 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, God who comforts us in all our afflictions so that, purpose, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. A lot of reasons, beloved, why tragedy and suffering and pain and difficult things happen in this life. And the list goes on and on and on in the Bible. Perhaps the greatest summary is found in John 9. Let's... let's Turn to that one. It's, uh, it's a critical one to get our arms around. John chapter 9. Remember the context here. The disciples and Jesus come one day upon a man who has been blind from birth. He's lived all his life as a blind man. So in that society, there was nothing left but to be a beggar, basically. And when they encounter this man who's been blind from birth, the disciples immediately jump to their moralist position, to what they have been raised with, to what they've been taught. And so they ask in John 9, verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You can almost see the kind of pride in their cleverness that's coming out of the disciples as they as they say this to Jesus, they're thinking, wow, Jesus is going to love this because we have some insight here. It might not be the guy himself. 
<laughs> he, may, he may not be blind because of what we did. It might have been because of what his parents did. We, we get that. They're proud that they can see this. Kind of an interesting case study, Jesus. Who really sinned here? Was it the guy? Or, you know, remember, he was born blind. So maybe, was it his parents? What does Jesus say? Verse 3. It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This isn't a judgment. This man being born, born blind and have the tragedy of living whatever number of years he had lived by that time was not the judgment of God on his life. It wasn't because he had sinned or because his parents would sin, although, of course, they both had. He was suffering in order that God might be glorified in his life. He's just like Job. He's just like Job. Same reason that Job suffered. Listen, got to kind of understand this and get this. Did Job sin enough? Did Job sin enough to deserve the things that came into his life? The answer is yes. We all do. We all deserve what Job experienced. But is that why those things came into Job's life? Absolutely not. The Bible says Job was a man who was righteous in all of his ways. Does that mean he was perfect? No. It means his heart was. It means he had a heart toward God. It means he had a heart of faith and trust in God. That's why he was covered. That's why God's judgment wasn't falling on. This was not God's judgment. What was it? We know from the context. God was showing himself to be great in Job's life. Satan thought, if I just destroy this guy, he will come apart. He will not believe in you. And God said, oh no, you do whatever you want, except he gave sake, you can't kill him. But you can do anything else you want. And what was displayed, the glory of God in the life of a man who lived in faith so much that he said, even if he kills me, I will trust in him. God was displaying his grace and his goodness and he was displaying how human beings can be in on this. Through the life of this blind man and through the life of Job, he was getting glory to himself. This is something a moralist would never understand. Moralism doesn't get that. But how does God say it in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9? You remember, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'm not like you. And whereas you want to apply this direct result to the life that somebody is living, that's not the way it always works. Don't take the moralist view on life. You will fool yourself. You will soon think you can be morally good enough to make it, and you can't. So we must not fall into the trap of moralism when interpreting tragedies. We must fall back on the grace of God, whose ways are bigger than our ways. We're not, listen, maybe this will help you. We're not always meant to know the reasons why. We're not always meant to know the reasons why. We're meant to know the one who knows the reasons why and to trust him. That's what this message is about. That's what this teaching of Jesus is about. So moralism, one of the traps. What's, what's the second, the second, the second great trap that we see here. Trap that people fall into when they see tragedy. Here it is. Because this is most of the people you know and most of the people I know and maybe some of you sitting here are in this trap. And this is the trap that says good people don't have to settle. Good in quotes. Good people don't have to settle. That's the second potential trap that Jesus is addressing here. The idea that good people don't have to settle out of court. Remember, look, 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 if you're back in Luke uh, 13, look back at, at verse 12 again, verse 58, where Jesus had said to this crowd, as you go with your accuser before the magistrate's parable, speaking of them, remember how we saw last week that the accuser and the magistrate and the prisoner are all God. So Jesus is saying, as you go with your accuser God to your magistrate God, settle with him on the way, 
Settle with God out of court. Settle with him before you die. It's too late after you die. Settle with him now. That's the message. What he's saying is settle with God while you have time. Don't go to judgment day without repentance. Settle while you can. But the underlying assumption of these people, of this crowd, is good people like us. Good people like us who are doing our best to keep the law of God who are doing our best to please God, who are living moral lives. We're not the ones getting thrown into jail or going to the prostitutes or doing all the other stuff that people do. Good people like us don't have to settle. We're good enough. We're good enough. We're good enough. I'm better than my next door neighbor. I'm better than the guy that lives down the street. I'm better than my boss. I'm good enough. Surely God will accept me. Jesus' answer is surely he will not. Such a serious message, beloved, because most of our world believes that. Turn with me to Luke 18. Jesus gave another parable. Luke 18, verse 11. We'll study in it in a few weeks, but, he, but here Jesus gives this parable and he, and he says there was this Pharisee who went up to the temple and he prayed, Luke 18, verse 11, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. What he's saying is, listen, I go to church. I give my money. I don't do all those other things that all the people around me are doing. And God, I just want to give you all the credit. I thank you that I'm not like that. Have you ever prayed like that? Most of us have prayed like that, beloved. He's making it sound like he's really appreciating God, but all he's doing is self-congratulating. He's a moralist. Now look at the rest of that. Verse 13, the tax collector, who the whole crowd would have said, that's the bad guy. The tax collector said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Actually, he says, be merciful to me, the sinner. And look at Jesus' verdict. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. The man who cast himself on God's mercy is justified. Yeah, but what about the other guy? Probably he is too, right? He's a good guy. <laughs> Jesus goes on, right? He says, this man went to his house justified rather than the other one. The good man was not justified. The good man was just morally good. The good man was morally good, but he wasn't perfect. He didn't meet the standard of God. He thought he didn't need to settle out of court because he was so good. But he was wrong. To assume that good people don't have to settle, beloved, would be a good assumption if there were any truly good people. There aren't. We have so much trouble getting that through our minds. Some of you remember a few years ago, this uh, Rabbi Kushner wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And his explanation for why bad things happen to good people was this, God isn't big enough to prevent it. That's his answer. I, I can worship a God who's not big enough to prevent it. I can't worship a God who is, who is big enough to prevent it, but he let my son die anyway. He had a very short view of life, but that's what his conclusion was. Somebody asked R.C. Sproul about that. They said, well, what do you, why do you think bad things happen to good people? And he said, I don't know, because I've never met a truly good person. That's the right answer. That's the Bible's answer. That's God's perspective. I don't know any good people. But when we see somebody who is morally good by our standards, we just assume, well, he doesn't need to settle out of court. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It was the wrong assumption. It was the wrong assumption in the first century. It's the wrong assumption now. Beloved, to see disaster and to be thankful is appropriate. It's appropriate that it didn't happen to us. But to assume that it didn't happen to us because we are good and don't deserve it is absolutely wrong. That's the point Jesus is trying to make. All disasters are a reminder that worse is coming. 
All disaster is reminding us that we are accountable to a God who is a consuming fire. All disasters are pointing us to one thing, repentance. All disasters are telling us falling towers are coming. All disasters are telling us repent rather than be self-righteous or indulge in God bashing. You can be mad at God for a little time. Don't be mad at God for very long because when you're mad at God, you've mistaken. You've mistaken. God is not bad. God is good. The blind uh, English poet John Milton was old and had become kind of obscure in his old age when he was visited one day by the king. Charles II came to see him. Now, if you remember your history, you'll remember that the father of Charles II was Charles I. Makes sense, right? And you'll remember that Charles I was, lost his throne when the Puritans under Cromwell took over the throne for a brief period of time. So Charles II, when he was restored to the throne, he came to Milton, he said, you know what, what I think, John Milton, he said, your blindness is a judgment of God for the part you took against my father. That was his moralistic outlook. Milton had a really good answer. Milton said, well, king, if I lost my sight through God's judgment, what can you say about your father who lost his head? What do you think about him? You see, the point is, we're all equally in this boat of unacceptability to God until we come by faith in Christ to have his righteousness become ours and our sin become his. We're all in the same boat. I saw... I saw I think it was Sproul again. I guess I'm mentioning him a lot today, but I remember one time he illustrated this. He said, he, said, he, he brought three guys up on the platform. He said, you stand here. You're Hitler. That's who you represent. Now he said, you stand over here. You represent Jesus Christ, clear on the other end of the platform. Now I said, you, who represent yourself, you're a morally good person. You're here at a conference. You stand where God sees you relative to Hitler and relative to Christ. Where? Somewhere in the middle? No, no. Right over here with Hitler. Why? Because God looks at our hearts, beloved, and he knows who we are. He knows the sin that resides there. He knows the evil that resides there. He's paid for it with his own blood so that we can be saved. The tower fell on him so it wouldn't fall on us. What he's saying is, accept me while there's still time. You can have eternal life, but only if you ask me. You're living on borrowed time. That's why Paul says, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Not later, not some other time. Now. You don't know when the tower is going to fall, right? Now is the time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It's, um, it's challenging, but Lord, it's, it's just truth. It just shows us who we are and what we are in your sight until we have the Lord Jesus as our covering, as our elder brother until we've been brought into the family of God. And so I pray this morning, Lord, for anyone who is counting on their moral good works, their goodness to get them to heaven, I pray that you will convict them that this will not work, this will not do. It didn't do for the Pharisee who prayed to you. It didn't do for the people who were judging the Galileans who got killed. It didn't do for anyone ever. The only thing that does is that we come to you in faith and say, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. If there's anyone here that needs to do that, Lord, help them to do it right now. Open their heart to you. Lord, we know that it's those that you've chosen who are saved. How do we know if we're chosen? Because we're willing to say yes to you. Thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you for the truth that Jesus so carefully represents. Bless us as we go to the rest of the day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.